we are recording. Okay, welcome everyone to week 12 of Open Life Science. This is one of my favorite calls. I might say this every call, but that's no, that's okay. Um, this is our careers call. Um, so today we're going to have some experts talking from various areas around research inside and outside academia. Um, and I will start with some quick housekeeping. So we are recording this call. It will go on YouTube later on. We also have all of the call transcribed using otter.ai. So on the top left of your screen, you can open the transcript of, this, of the call and you can actually uh, just watch what's uh, being said in real time. And we have a code of conduct. So for open life science calls, we ask that when you interact with one another, um, both in the call and in any other open life science uh, areas, such as the Slack, then we ask that you treat one another with the respect that you'd like to be treated. And at any point, if you feel like this has not happened, either you have witnessed or experienced something, then you can report that. We have some contact information over on the first or second page, actually it's the third page of the sign-in of the agenda sheet. Um, this can be emailing team at openlifesci.org, which re reaches all of the organizers, or you can email any of us individually because um, sometimes you might just want to reach out to one person on their own and all of our email addresses are in the document. Um, so today is a little bit different from many of the many many of the calls. We don't actually have a breakout room today. We have a silent reflection towards the end of the call, but largely we have presentations from our speakers. Um, so with that, I am actually going to hand it over to Maya, who's going to be introducing our first two speakers today. Maya, over to you. Hi, um, thank you, Yor. So. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce David Opoku, who will be talking about social entrepreneurship, uh, about his uh, career path and experience. And um, while he's talking, I would invite uh, people to write in the chat or in the um, yeah questions and answers uh, questions. Sorry, at the page four. Okay, um, David, please. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much, Maya. Thanks, everyone. Please, can you let me know if you can see my screen? Awesome. Hi, everyone. It is so great to be here. Um, I was privileged to be part of the OLS2 cohort as a mentor, advisor. I couldn't join this um, cohort, but I was so excited when I got that email from Malvika and the team to share around my journey around entrepreneurship. So I'll be spending the next five to six minutes just talking about how I ended up here, just giving some um, anecdotes, um, and then hopefully later during the question and answer session, I can answer some questions too. So my name is David Salasio Poku. I'm currently a farmer. I saw somebody mention that that was one of their goals. Uh, so glad to see that. And also co-founder of Going Gold Farms, and also recently um, a fellow at the Stanford Digital Civil Society Lab we're exploring issues around African food sovereignty. So to start off, I wanna start with the definition of social entrepreneurship. I picked this up from Shopify actually has a definition that I like, and it says that it's doing business for a social cause. It might also be referred to as altruistic entrepreneurship, interesting. And then it combines commerce and social issues in the way that improves the lives of people connected to a cause. And the success usually is not me measured in profit alone. Um, but then you ask the question, shouldn't all entrepreneurship be social then? Because everything should benefit people. So I tend to generally look at it as entrepreneurship should, should be social. Now I mentioned this because I think there's a strong connection to open science and the principles that exist within open science and openness. And I think the Turing way, um, really highlight some of these aspects. If you've not checked out the resource, you should check it out. I'm sure Alvika and team have mentioned this several times. But when we talk about collaboration, we talk about project design, we talk about reproducibility, communication, outreach, ethics, all these to some extent are leading to social outcomes that benefit not just a group of individuals, but anybody. We're talking about accessibility. And I think anyone who practices this ends up building up skills that end up being very relevant to social entrepreneurship. So now I'm gonna talk about my journey and I hope through this, 
you'd be able to see how what I ended up doing to some extent led me to the path where I could feel a little bit more comfortable or adventurous to be in a social entrepreneur. So I'll start from Ghana. I lived there for about 17 years of my life, lower middle class, Christian family, farming family. Um, and then I was privileged to get a scholarship to go to the last two years of high school in Costa Rica. Um, ended up being in class with students from over 65 different countries, which started exposing me to um, the world and areas around commonalities that we had and also differences. But I think the heart of that became that we are all very similar. We all care about generally similar issues. And, and that was a life-changing moment. I did six years in the US where I did my undergrad and my master's in biology and then computer science. I also did some research with UNICEF and a lot of civic engagement work. And I think in all of that, starting to understand how what I was learning was going to be helpful to um, different individuals, different communities. Whatever I did should have an impact on communities. Um, I then returned to Ghana and worked at a tech incubator. And one of the things that I quickly became a champion of because that really didn't exist was the local open data advocates. And the reason was because at least in Ghana at that time, a lot of the entrepreneurs were trying to build products or trying to work with data, but most of the data sets were not contextualized to Ghana and most of Africa. So I became the person who was pushing this forward, um, which then led me into the open data space. I joined Open Knowledge Foundation, which is an organization that works in promoted open data principles um, and was fortunate enough to become um, the data, what I call a data plumber, helping journalists, civil society organizations, researchers think about how open data principles, openness can be embedded into the work that they do. Um, at the heart of that was really recognizing that accessibility in terms of solving issues was, was a big thing to pay attention to. And I think in there, became the values that now have led me to um, leaving to focus on building a farm. And, and the reason why I left to become a farmer or build Going Gold Farm was because I saw a problem that across the world, we have an issue around how we're going to feed the world. Farmers are a very important group of people who are going to be leading this. But at the same time, most of the time, they don't have access to the skills and the resources that we need to push this forward. And so Going Gold, um, is aiming to figure out ways to do that with farmers in resource constraints environments. Um, and so I've talked about social entrepreneurship, I've talked about open science, and I think at the heart of all of those are community. You hear that being repeated in, in these two spaces. You hear about the commons where there's collective ownership of some kind of resource that is accessible. And then you hear about society. And I think for anyone who um, believes in these principles, who practices this, who uses this, social entrepreneurship is also an avenue for you to explore because you are definitely an expert and some of the challenges that you deal with or you have mastered will become relevant in there. Um, so a little bit about Going Gold Farms. We have four main phases that we wanna go through. Um, we wanna consistently produce healthy and affordable food using sustainable and accessible practices. We want to build the capacity of other smallholder farmers to produce sustainably and smallholder farmers because we believe that they actually um, build or have the ethos around sustainability food sovereignty that is needed in this world and we want to make smallholder farms and farmers more resilient to processing of their produce and then finally we want to turn farms into spaces of education innovation leisure and fun and how um, does a day or a week look like um, in a day or in a week, I'm reading, or my team and I, we're reading about ways of implementing research um, to this problem. So everything from reading about breeding plants in, and about GMO and why that leads to outcomes that actually doesn't benefit communities, or even looking at science and ways to make data much more accessible, or helping my dad who's a farmer for over 40 years, but doesn't really collect data in the way that makes it much easier for him to appreciate that and make that much more accessible to him. Um, so putting together and enabling a team of innovators. So that's level of collaboration. We can't do things alone. So how do we bring in teams of different experts to do this? And then believing in ourselves um, each and every day. 
So I just wanted to say, so social entrepreneurship, should I do it? There, there are four things that I put down that may be helpful if you want to consider this. Um, you see a social itch that no one you know is solving. Yeah, so that may be one factor to consider. Another, if there's no fixed salary, no problem. Um, that's, that's something we can talk about later, but it's not um, the comfort of having a salary in, in other spaces may not always be guaranteed. You tend to be a generalist by nature, but a specialist by necessity. Um, so you do everything and then you specialize in specific areas that you want when it's needed. And if not now, when? There's something that you've always wanted to explore and maybe now's the time you try it out and you figure out whether this is a path to pursue or maybe it was a waste of your time. At least you know that. So these are some things that you may consider if you wanna pursue this path. Um, and then, then I wanna wrap up with three anecdotes that I've picked up that I believe have helped me so far and even other people that I advise who are pursuing the entrepreneurship path. So being versatile, um, and I said generalize and then specialize. So social entrepreneurship leverages on the ability to generalize, being interested in different things, different issues and how to solve that and then finding a way to, to specialize in whatever that issue is. Um, and again, so for me, being able to understand data, but being able to understand product development, being able to understand different societies and cultures and the way that they behave, and then specializing on a specific skills. I think social entrepreneurship gives you the ability to start off as a journalist and then look at an issue and where you wanna specialize in that. Um, I think to do this, you need to see people. At the heart of this is people that you're working with. They are either dealing with issues or they are innovating and being able to start with them as people before whatever technology, whatever solution is important, but also letting yourself be seen um, as opposed to either being in academia or even being in a lab. Uh, being a social entrepreneur, you need to be out there. You need to be talking to customers. You need to be talking to communities. You need to be building that relationship, but you also have to let people see you um, let them know you for who you are. Um, and so that's important. And, and that's one of the anecdotes that I've picked over time. And then this is kind of uh, a joke, but ground your, your identity in your job. Actually do not ground your identity in your job. Um, your job will go, but who you are as a person wouldn't. And I think being able to find ways to um, thrive outside your job, whether it's as a social entrepreneur, whether it's as somebody who is in a company, who is in a university, in a lab, letting your identity not be grounded in that because that could always change. It's a valuable thing that I've learned. Um, in the past, maybe six months, there have been many opportunities that I have failed at, I have not been accepted in, and learning um, that that is not what my identity is. My identity is beyond that has been something that's kept me going. So. With that, my last thing that I'll say is that breathe. The most important thing, especially in this time of COVID, <laughs> is your life. <laughs> Everything else is replaceable. And I think if you wanna go down the path of a social entrepreneur or any other career option, just making sure that you're living a life that is balanced, that you can um, thrive and, and be healthy is what will keep you going in whatever path you take. So stay human and be open. And with that, I will end here. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, David. That, uh, as always, was just an absolutely incredible talk, um, leaving me feel, feeling just inspired. Uh, unfortunately, Maya's having a little bit of internet problems, so I've had to step in uh, to host the Q&A. Uh, but can we have a huge round of applause uh, for David? That was really amazing. Thanks all. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to check quickly in the document if we have any questions that have come in at this point. Um, I don't see any right now. Um, in that case, we can always leave a we have a Q&A panel towards the end. So we can, I guess, just move on to our next speaker. Um, no, thank you so much. Uh, so Thomas, are you available and ready? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Um, so we have Thomas here today to talk about the Open Lab and Makers Movement, and I think we're really excited to hear from you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Let me uh, share my screen. I have some slide for you. Okay, can you see my screen? Looks perfect. Okay, yes. Uh, my name is Thomas Mboa. I'm uh, from Cameroon. And um, my background is in uh, biochemistry, uh, specifically uh, uh, molecular uh, biology. So I got a bachelor degree on molecular biology. And then I, I studied uh, science of education and I get I got like two master degrees in science of education. And then I did my PhD in um, uh, in public communication at the University Laval in Canada. So uh, during all my academic courses, I was always always impressed by uh, information. How information can be. Uh, uh, share it, how information can be reused. And um, that is why from this interest, I encountered the open science movement eight years ago with, uh, uh, through the OCSD net, Open and Collaborative Science uh, Network. And um, from OCSD net funded our project. Our project was uh, Project SOA. Uh, a project to promote open science in French and in French speaking African countries and Haiti. And so that is how I build uh, my network through organization working in on uh, open access, uh, uh, open art way and uh, any kind of uh, uh, openness, uh, open <laughs> or any kind of dimension uh, related to open science. And locally, um, I, I, I build some initiative like uh, the Decolonial Library, Dominique Vogo, and uh, the Mboa Lab. Uh, today, I will spend more time on uh, the Mboa Lab with the maker movement, but I want also to tell that I'm a researcher, I'm doing research action because I'm also the lect lecturer at the Advanced School of Mass Communication here in Cameroon, where I'm teaching uh, digital humanities, uh, open science, and um, all what is related to uh, scholarly communication. So <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is me. So the Mboa Lab, I founded the Mboa Lab in 2018, and uh, is a kind of reification of uh, my thesis because my thesis is on the maker movement and the techno coloniality in French uh, African countries. So the Mboa Lab is a kind of concrete realization of uh, what I learned from uh, uh, the, the Mboa Lab. And the Mboa Lab is specialized on uh, uh, biotechnology uh, due to my background in, uh, in biochemistry. Uh, so what we are doing at the Mwala, we have like a, a, a related to uh, public health and biotechnology, we have uh, three main activity. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello, yeah, so can, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, we have like three uh, main uh, uh, activity related to public health. So the first one is a very complex one, local production of enzyme and reagents. So that is a, a high level of, uh, uh, of uh, molecular biology, if I can say. And um, what we are doing, uh, we are producing enzyme locally because when I stopped my study in biochemistry, 16 years ago, it was mostly because I was impressed by molecular biology, but they told us that we cannot do it from Cameroon, from our lab because equipment and reagents are so expensive. So when I encountered the open science movement, movement, I realized that through openness, there is a lot of uh, thing that I can uh, overcome, a lot of barriers of uh, yeah, present in my past that I can co overcome and help uh, a new generation of African and uh, 
Cameroonian to to succeed in molecular biology. So uh, we are producing enzyme for molecular biology, and currently we are so we are selling the, those enzyme uh, in Cameroon in uh, in Ghana, where we have some collaborators and. Um, everywhere in uh, Central Africa when someone uh, need uh, uh, enzyme. So that is uh, like the, 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 the deep uh, molecular biology part of uh, our work we are doing in the, at the Mbois lab. And the second thing is local hardware manufacturing because uh, one thing that I'm advocating for is local manufacturing because we need, in terms of openness, we don't need uh, uh, to work with uh, black box. We need to be able to fix our own uh, uh, equipment if they are broken. And we need to understand the process from the beginning uh, to the end, how such equipment uh, will. So that is why also uh, we are working, uh, some of our equipment are used, are built uh, by ourselves. And uh, some of uh, my work related to this has been featured in two uh, natural articles talking about uh, all the work we are doing uh, at the Mwala. Our third activity is capacity building because it's very important for us to build a new generation of uh, Cameroonian and, um, and uh, African able to understand, to trust, able to trust in themselves and able to build uh, things from uh, Africa, from what we are doing so we are teaching we used to we are working with a local university so we used to host intern we need we used to train them uh, through a, a workshop and <clears throat> but it's not easy because we have uh, 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 some challenges and uh, uh, funding is the first one because we are depending of uh, international uh, uh, collaboration sometime and um, the there is a kind of lack of uh, lack of uh, local uh, awareness and support so we are trying to overcome all this kind of uh, 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 barrier and also very important is <laughs> some barriers like language barriers i'm sure that you have understood that i'm not english is not my primary language but um I have uh, uh, French is my, uh, <laughs> I have, I done all my studies, all my school in French. So French, if I can say, even if the two language are colonial language for us, but uh, French is, I'm fluent in French more than in English. So that sometimes also it can be a, a barrier for, uh, for us. And we we don't have the, the the government support also, so it's very important to have the government support. But here is very difficult. But through the good uh, vibes we have and the good collaboration we have at, at international level, we are still uh, sustainable through the research development we are doing. And uh, yes, this, <laughs> just to say uh, thank you. This is a small team, the small team of the Mwala with uh, some women and me here. Uh, that is the permanent, the permanent at the Mwala. But, and we have a lot of volunteer and intern, but here is the five the permanent of the Mwala doing all the, the magics and the work. So, uh, Thank you very much for your keen attention. Amazing. Thank you so much, Tomar. Can we have a huge round of applause for a very, really, really fascinating talk? So um, I know we've been having some questions popping in through the doc. Uh, we had some come in through for David. Um, I think since we have some time, there's probably time for one question uh, at the minute. So I'll just ask, um, Thomas, we've, we're asking here, um, how, has, uh, how, how have you built capacity for French-speaking researchers? 
So for French speaking research, we are doing a lot of uh, translation. So when we have a, a resources, an open educational resources or a protocol available, uh, you will see that a lot of our resources are in French and in English. So that is uh, mostly what uh, we are doing. So it's like <laughs> we are doing all the protocol twice in English and in French. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of job, uh, uh, but we need to do it if we don't want to 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 put away uh, some part of uh, the Cameroonian population. As you know, Cameroon is a bilingual country, English and French, but I'm French Cameroonian. <laughs> that sounds like so much work. Um, that's really incredible. Um, Folks, bring, keep the questions piling in. Um, we will come to the rest of the questions towards the end when we do the panel. Um, I am going to pass over to Malvika. I think you're hosting the next uh, speaker. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talks. Uh, the, sec the next speaker we have Zulidiana. Uh, she's from Malaysia. And I just want to give a shout out to Hilia, who's been helping us uh, identify a lot more speakers from uh, Southeast Asian community. And I'm really excited to have you on the call, Zulidiana, uh, to you. Uh, hi, Malfika. Uh, actually, I come from Indonesia. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so sorry, yeah. Uh, we're just a neighbor. Uh, Would so, you like to uh, share your screen? Okay, let me try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, uh, is it appear there? The Perfect. There? Yeah, looks okay. great. Okay, let me I'll make it into a bigger screen because probably it better to not have any slideshow. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you for having me here and telling stories about what we do during these five years uh, about of science and general managers in Indonesia. Uh, for introduction, my name is Sulidiana Rusnasari. You can call me Lydia or Diana. Uh, I'm a public relations officer of Relawan Journal Indonesia is a non-profit organization to help to gather people and sharing their knowledge. Uh, and uh, what we are different from the others non-profit organization because um, actually when we started, we don't know much about uh, journal publications, academic publication and so on. We are growing together, learning and sharing and updating all the time. That's why uh, in a, the title, I call it, it's, it's a never ending learning because we always do the learning process from the beginning of the organization and until now. So first of all, I will tell you about the story about Indonesia during these five years. So we have to make a publishers in journals and academics. Uh, there are several very big publishers. Uh, they really dominate almost all subjects, uh, even in Indonesia, even we have the language barriers. So as you know that English is not my native language, I am Indonesian. Uh, but because I learned about the English literature and so on, uh, so I can uh, through those uh, language barriers. So pardon me if my English is not really good, but I will try my best to explain you about the stories about journal managers in Indonesia. We lack of sources um, and we also lack of support. That's why it's like uh, we did, we were in 2016, we started this organization like uh, some people in the dark room, 
uh, and we have to and some people in the dark room and we close our eyes so even when our eyes is open we still cannot see anything that's why we have to make the light itself by sharing so uh, this picture is created by uh, mr erwin that will be uh, present next week uh, our local and national publisher is just like this and we are surviving until now and we are still growing and the number of uh, journals in indonesia is growing very fast and this is not all journals in indonesia is about business but mostly we share because we want to participate so that started in 2016 there were changed in government regulation in scientific publication for from printed to uh, online. So uh, they gather, people gather information from trainings and meetings. But sadly, at the time, those trainings and those meetings are very expensive. We have uh, some organization that already well literate about this academic publishing, but they are so explosive. So uh, we have to uh, spend more than uh, in a very big amount of money, but the institution is very uh, diverse. Small institutions also have journal publishing, so they cannot afford to join the trainings and meetings. That's why in 2016, we started these organizations uh, some journal managers from across Ireland and Indonesia gathered and started the idea to build an NGO, the non-profit one, to educate. This is not meaning that we will educate it now, but we started uh, in a very basic level of knowledge about academic publishing. So uh, we are building a community. Uh, we have the journal managers along with authors and the viewers. And in 2000 and, uh, 2000 and, uh, 2020, when we, when we launched our, uh, one of our, we were launched one of our uh, publications program, uh, we have these pictures from outside the organization. So uh, Mr. Erwin is drawing this, but actually he is not part of our organization, but he was saying that uh, as an organization, we have the skills, we have the knowledge, and we have the public support. That's what uh, power us because uh, we want to, let's say, uh, have research that really engaging to all people, not only for those in academia, but also for society. And it also can influence the government in the long run. But the potential that we have uh, in the corners of Indonesia, in the corners of thousands of islands in Indonesia, should have already known by people, not only from the academic publication, but also for all people that becomes, for example, like teachers, uh, lecturers, students, even those who are claiming themselves as researchers, because uh, we have a challenge that when we read about sources, mostly sources are in English, but actually the sources that are already in our country haven't published yet. So the language barrier becomes a homework for us. But we're dealing with that because many of uh, people in, in the organizations are volunteer. They are giving their time, they are giving their energy, and they're also giving their ideas to building up this nonprofit organization. So if we talk about open science in Indonesian journals, technically, practically, mostly because we are using 
OJS as the platform by PKP. But the openness itself actually started because we are volunteers that gathering together. We are growing for only a bunch of people. Now we have more than 200 volunteers around Indonesia in 30, uh, in a, in for, uh, sorry, Indonesia have 34 provinces. So in each provinces, we have a representation, representative person who manage to be the person, the PIC person that probably if people need help, can contact this person. If this person cannot uh, afford to help them, they can contact us in in the center of Indonesia to uh, to come to their cities or their town. We work together to assist journal managers. This is very challenging because uh, not all people, it's very limited people in Indonesia very, uh, has computer literate. They also have the language barrier. So technical problem, internet connection, and also the literacy becomes our problem at first in the during three years we uh, start our training by building awareness why academic publication is important for us why writing in academic way is important why people has to read why so those basic ideas and skills are everywhere it's just like a very big homework for us but this community now uh, become place to find answers because we have a platform. We built a platform that people can register, log in and ask because those 200 volunteers already there to answer the question for all, all around Indonesia. So they can drop the questions. We answer, we also provide a YouTube tutorial. We also provide text, examples, and so on. In many sources, we also use Zenodo to, uh, let's say, keeping our uh, documents so everybody can access. We, we also uh, have, let's say, uh, before COVID, uh, I, usually we also going places in Indonesia to have training, meeting them face to face and uh, train them how to manage a journal, an academic journal. We provide even and mostly free of charge because now uh, during COVID, all of them are online. So these events is regularly like uh, once in a week. Sometimes we do it once uh in uh two days for like series for example like we collaborate with the oig uh, we collaborate with them so we can let's say having series of training uh the best line that make us always growing is culture of sharing because uh this sharing even the knowledge is very limited in one person but we share it and this part of little knowledge that we have and and then it's also uh join with the other peoples that also probably just little knowledge those little knowledge becomes a mountain of knowledge academia researcher librarian etc everyone everyone who concern about academic publication journals uh usually they becomes our big supporters and we collaborate to grow. RJE as uh, Indonesian Journal Volunteer Association, because we are a nonprofit organization, the concern is more in management the scientific journals in Indonesia. And to support it, we collaborate with ORCID. We uh, have a good member of ORCID, and four of the Crossref ambassadors from Indonesia are RGE volunteers, uh, including me, becomes the cross Life ambassadors. And we also building a good network with 
LIPI. LIPI is Indonesian Institute of Sciences. It's a government institute of sciences. To and for this collaboration, we developed what we call the journal stories.ai. This is the platform still in building. I mean, it, it haven't launched yet because uh, we plan to launch this platform in uh, June, in this June 2021. This platform becomes a hub between scientific journal managers, scientific journal management association, and scientific associations. So to, uh, we have different point of view here in Indonesia because uh, we don't, we don't actually, we don't really comfortable with the rank from Simago, for example, because we don't really comfortable with that. We create our uh, network by uh, also uh, bringing up the scientific associations. So the ones that we believe that uh, those people in associations, in scientific associations, are people who can, uh, let's say, they can charge whether this journal has to improve in what way. Uh, is it a good journal or is it a, a journal that needs to improve improvement? We are not saying any bad journals because we don't have any blacklisted journals, no. We, are concerning about improving, not blacklisting, including and excluding indexing. That's not our main goal because we built ourselves uh, from scratch. So we want everyone's journal managers, reviewers, authors, uh, they are keeping the quality as a community along with a scientific association. So uh, the obstacles, of course, uh, <laughs> pragmatic people around Indonesia. There are so many pragmatic people. They uh, get they. Uh, there are also some people becomes mafia publication. They provide instant publication, unethical practice of publication, and the second uh, big obstacle is the culture of writing. Indonesian people has a culture of speaking and telling stories, but they are not really good in writing, actually. Writing is uh, one of our biggest obstacles to get in touch with the publishing in academy. And the third obstacle is the competition among education institutions. For it, because, I, you know, uh, there are so many competitions uh, because of the rank, and that make us compete most, of, but most of the ways actually is the sometimes it's not appropriate. That's why uh, in journal stories later, we don't have any rank, but we have stickers and labels just like we are doing in games. And in, two, in 2020, um, RGE as a nonprofit organization, but we can become the bronze sponsor for the OIJ. We have uh, more than 10 people becomes associate editors. And we have also uh, three people becomes editors in the OIJ. This is our milestone to participate in open science worldwide. And uh, LGE also become the biggest process affiliation in the world. Because even we started as community, we, we be uh, we uh, we help more than five thousand journals in Indonesia and outside Indonesia that publish from one thousand and five hundred local publishers. So uh, we becomes uh, the number is getting high and high because uh, institutions almost all education institutionals building their own journals publication. Uh, sometimes uh, probably this is bad, but actually we do it because we want uh, more quantity to start the quality itself. So we also, as an organization, we also 
feel uh, unusual journals because this is an open journal. This is our pilot project. We call it Pub Letter. The pilot project because we use open review. So the reviewers and the authors, uh, everything is open. The reviewers uh, can know, this is not blind review because the author knows who reviews their uh, manuscript and the reviewers also uh, participate uh, voluntarily. We are not bothered by the close rules like subscribes or blind review or even transfer copyright uh, because uh, this pop letter is also discussed about publication in Indonesia. We also fund, uh, have a fund, uh, funding for research in academic publications. Uh, the, for two, uh, two groups of researchers that research about academic publications. So uh, those funding that we have, we share it into OIG, or kit, and then also with people who has uh, ideas to research in academic publications. So the research should be talk about uh, publications. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, well, no, my last word, the last slide is about thank you. Uh, we, I call it never ending learning because we encourage also teachers to involve their students because uh, we started to look at to in the early age, uh, they can uh, submit their manuscript or their narrative science in journal for school. This is also our pilot projects. And I call it never ending learning because this is a very long road and never ending because we always update the information, the system of the journal itself, the changing rules in the worldwide and the changing rules in my government. Uh, sometimes they are, uh, they are different in, you know, uh, when they are deciding what is good, what is bad. So this updating is doing all the time. That's why the learning process is always there. And the obstacle, one of them is also the lack of human resources along with language barrier. So that we invite everyone here to collaborate. If you want to collaborate with us, don't, don't hesitate to uh, drop an email for me and celebrate this learning process. Okay, that's all uh, for my presentation. Oh, uh, this is in Indonesia. It means in English, sharing to enhance the publications. Thank you very much, Malvika. I Thank you so much. I uh, we have a few questions, but I'll save that for the panel uh, as if we can, yeah, if we can have a round of applause for Zulitiana for sharing this incredible work. Thank you. Okay, to you for the next speaker. Amazing. Thank you so much, every, um, Zulitiana and Moveka. Uh, so I'm really excited uh, to introduce the next speaker. Um, this is actually my incredible colleague in my day job when I'm not uh, wearing my open life science hat. Uh, so uh, Natalie Banner, she works at the Wellcome Trust um, currently as the lead for the Understanding Patient Data Team. Uh, but I'll let her explain her own history uh, and career path. Natalie, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Joe. Um, real pleasure to be invited and um, sorry to miss the early part um, of the meeting. Looking forward to catching, catching up with it on YouTube. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for the invite. Um, I feel like a bit of a fraud and a bit of an interloper, I have to say, because I'm not a scientist. Uh, I'm a philosopher by training. Um, and I thought that in, I would uh, try and give you a bit of an overview of, of my career, my career path and how I've ended up 
where I am and, and talk a little bit about um, the kind of principles of, of openness. And uh, indeed, given that I work on the, the concept of trust and trustworthiness, um, how that might be relevant uh, for the open open science um, agenda more broadly, um, but kind of within the within the context and through the lens of kind of my, my career path and trajectory. So forgive me, I am not a scientist, but I hope that some of the things I have to say might spark some ideas um, and some, some, some thoughts uh, among you all today. So as I mentioned, I'm a philosopher by training. Uh, my academic research was in the philosophy of psychiatry. Um, that was my academic background, my PhD and, and my postdoc. Um, and I've taken a very interesting route uh, to the sort of science health policy engagement space where I am now um, and lead, as, as Yo said, an initiative called Understanding Patient Data, which involves a mix of, of policy work, uh, communications and community and health system engagement. Um, but I want to take a little bit of a step back um, and, and try and articulate how and why this is a very coherent career path. I promise you, it hasn't just been entirely meandering. Um, but actually, my, my, my path has very much been driven by a mix of, I, I'd say, curiosity and opportunism. Uh, but I've always seen myself as being a bit of a bridge builder. Um, what I've always enjoyed has been working at the intersection of different disciplines, understanding what they can bring to each other, how they can learn from one another, where there might be creative tension between them, and how you can actually use the, the language, the concepts, the learning from one academic discipline and apply it in another, um, especially where there's a kind of lack of initial mutual understanding, maybe conceptual confusions, maybe you know, common language across those different fields. So I started off uh, working across philosophy and psychology. A lot of my philosophical training was very kind of European, very Anglo, and then trying to draw in psychology as well. I then developed into, into the field of psychiatry and mental health and looked at how tools of analytic philosophy of mind and language and cognitive science um, could help inform our understanding of mental ill health and particularly the notion of decision making capacity, where and how you're able to make decisions um, about how you can be treated if you're suffering from a mental health condition. So very, very interesting work across those intersections of different disciplines. But then as I progressed through, um, through academia and took a decision to leave academia, I became increasingly interested in another intersection between academia and policy. And I did a policy internship um, in the UK Parliament at a place called the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology for three months, which really opened my eyes to uh, how interesting policy work could potentially be, but also where there was tensions with academia. Um, you had policymakers who needed answers to questions about services and public policy and academics who were desperately trying to provide evidence but they were talking totally different languages, working on different timelines. A lot of the academic research at the time was kind of paywalled. It wasn't necessarily openly available. And the academics were very frustrated that policymakers weren't taking on board their evidence. And the policymakers were very frustrated that the academics could never give them a straight answer and caveated everything with footnotes, saying more research is needed. You need to fund us to do more research and we'll come back to you with an answer in three years time. So again, really interesting intersection between those, those different areas. As I got more involved in, in the policy world and joined Welcome, um, I did a lot of work across um, in Parliament, uh, particularly in the House of Lords, um, in relation to the development and implementation of GDPR, the G General Data Protection Regulation that governs um, individual data rights in, in the EU. Um, I did a lot of work on global bioethics uh, and particularly um, looking at how to set up um, uh, the ethics and regulation work that was being done in a uh, Pan-African Genetics and Genomics Consortium. And that was there that I got really interested in the ideas around data governance, um, particularly in genomics, where at the time there were many debates going on about balancing the drive for openness and open science and open data with the need to preserve and protect confidentiality, people's rights over their own data. And there was, a, again, a huge tension here um, between different, different factors. Some people saying, you know, we need to open up the science as much as physically possible, put all the data out there. And others saying, well, actually, that there are you know, some potentially really substantial privacy risks from sharing genetic and genomic data um, as widely um, as, as some wanted to. So, you know, again, this kind of tension between different, um, different mindsets and different views and different perspectives, uh, which was something that, that really drove me on. 
I'm now working in the space of, I guess, I guess policy and, and the public um, around the use of health data. And uh, this is an area that I've been working on for the last um, few years. And again, in, in, in all of this, the principles of openness have been really, really critical. Um, because actually, I mean, you definitely see in light of the pandemic, there's a huge public appetite for information about, uh, about data, about how science works, about how science has led us to the vaccines, about the evidence we have for the public health uh, response that various governments have, have developed um, in, light of, uh, in light of the pandemic. The R number is suddenly something that all of us know about, um, and that's never really happened before, but there's a large appetite among the public to learn more about the processes of science and how data is used and how insights are generated. And we do a lot of work on the notion of trust and trustworthiness in how data is used. And I think the elements of trustworthiness very much align with the principles around open science, um, which is very much about transparency, ensuring that information is meaningful and available and accessible to those who want to find it. Uh, it raises questions about reproducibility. Can other people you know, replicate the findings that you're developing? But also, I think in addition, um, that might be of more interest to, to this audience too, thinking beyond transparency, the idea of public involvement in shaping research, uh, because again, there's an appetite for people to actually be more actively involved in the development of research questions, in how science is conducted and disseminated and the learning from it um, kind of shared as widely as possible. And that's particularly the case, um, I think, with given, given COVID and, and the impacts that we've seen from that, where there are potentially communities and, and groups who have not been typically represented or visible in data before, or they might even be you know, over-targeted and, and, and dis potentially discriminated against as a result of the use of data. So our work is very much around trying to open up conversations about the use of data in the development of, of, of science, in the development of research and, and, and scientific insight, but doing it in a way that isn't just putting all the information out there, um, but actually trying to curate some conversations, listen to the questions people have, challenge those who are making decisions about how data is used to be open to the questions and the scrutiny and the challenge of the public and, and indeed of, of, of patients and of healthcare professionals uh, working in the health space. So that's kind of the broad um, uh, focus of, of the work we do at understanding patient data. Um, and I think that uh, these, the principles behind open science are actually really, really applicable to that wider uh, public debate and public appetite for further information about the way that science works, how data is collected and managed and developed and used um, to develop scientific insight. So hopefully I prompted a, just a few thoughts about um, how, how sort of you as a community, as an open science community, um, can and, and should think about opening up kind of beyond science and, and academic disciplines to different and, and wider audiences, I think particularly in light, um, in light of the pandemic. Um, but I'd be really keen to, you know, to, to discuss more in the panel. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to stop there and very, very happy to answer any questions in the discussion. Thanks, Jo. Amazing. Thank you so much, Natalie. And I can see we have our round of hands coming in uh, for Natalie's really interesting and inspiring talk. So thanks, folks. <laughs> I think my cat set up. Unfortunately, no cats available at the moment, but they may they may arrive in the next 20 minutes. I just have to say, uh, sometimes in our team meetings, a cat paw just sort of appears above the camera like this, and it is amazing. <laughs> um, so folks, Please, um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Natalie, please pop those into the um, document. Um, I'm actually just going to hand it straight over to Malvika so we can have some time for a panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jo, and thanks again for the wonderful talk. I'm trying to pin uh, the speakers in case folks are able to see them properly. Um, I have curated four questions for each speaker, um, and I'm going to probably just start with Natalie because it's quite fresh. Um, the question is, what can we learn from policymakers in building pathways for public debate to happen constructively and integrate their concern fairly in our work? I think this question mostly comes in the context that a lot of us are not very much aware of how policymaking happens in research and where different voices should be taken into account. Mm. 
Thanks. It's a really great question. I mean, the first thing to note is that, you know, as, as I said, ac academic, academic research and policy, they operate on different timescales. Um, they have different sort of levels of detail required. And actually, I think the most constructive way to engage with, with policy and policymakers is to understand um, what the different motives and incentives of, of those uh, of those policymakers are. What is it they're trying to achieve? And actually, that usually requires a bit of a relationship. It requires an understanding of um, of, of, of the people involved and the institutions involved, as opposed to there being a kind of one off. I've got a research paper. I think policymakers will be interested. I need to find the right person to, to, to plug into. Um, so a lot of these things take time and, and relations um, to develop. So I'd say that that's one of the key. That's one of the key things. I'd also think about policy quite widely. I mean, most people think of policy and they think of national governments, but actually, you know, there there are a huge number of uh, of other organisations and institutions that have policy development. I mean, policy essentially means you know setting setting rules. Um, so whether that's universities. Um, research organizations and funding organizations, NGOs, charities, uh, local governments, um, and initiatives like that. It, it's not always about that sort of big picture national or international level uh, policy. So if it is something that you're interested in, I'd say, you know, start local, start small uh, with the kind of institutions and organizations around you um, and learn a little bit about, you know, what they're interested in and what they're and what they're um, what they're potentially um, you know developing ideas and policy on. Um, so I suppose that would be my my kind of key um, key bit of advice when thinking about about policy making. Um, and very often policymakers they, they will want a quick answer to a thing, and that's not really the way that science works. So I think just sort of being upfront about the fact that your 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 you know your research may well uh, have limitations and caveats, and kind of being open about that is really important. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have two more questions which are very similar in this direction. Originally written for David, but I'm going to ask Toma first and then David. Uh, the question is around how can we integrate a sense of social responsibility in what we do? How can open science become fuel for change in culture towards building socially responsible projects? So Toma, especially talking about uh, the francophone uh, focus that you have uh, and and often most of the research isn't doing the double amount of work that you said that you need to write same thing but you need to write twice for different people and you also said that you're trying to build a mindset in Cameroonian so they actually trust the knowledge that they are building can you speak a bit more about um, that a bit okay uh, thank you very much for uh, your question. So, for me, uh, in to in order to integrate uh, the sense of social responsibility in what we are doing, um, we need to bear in mind that uh, uh, the maker movement is uh, a community-based movement. So, the first thing is to hear the community and build all what we are doing from the community we are we are we are here to work for the community so you can not come with your own idea or your own vision of the world and try to impose it to a local uh, a community uh, so the the, 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 the the most important thing is to is to start by is to start is to start by <laughs> Sorry, you pass. This is this is what you will not get in a traditional uh, conference. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that is uh, the 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 main. Sorry, my dog. Don't worry, Thomas. This is this is an added okay. for us. Put the community in the center of uh, what we are doing, and uh, the second thing: how open science can be the field. You know. Open science is defined as a three level of uh, openness. The first level, as defined by uh, uh, Leslie Chan and France Piron in November, three level of openness. The first level is open and to, openness to research and data. The second level of openness is openness to society. And the third level is openness to other knowledge and epistemologies. So if you take all these layers of open science and openness, it's true that everyone will feel, uh, will find himself in 
and use available knowledge uh, circulating freely on it through internet or or whatever uh, all kind of uh, network you want to solve local problem so use available knowledge to solve local problem and also when you are working at international level with uh, another culture and another people is very important to be open to hear firstly from them and try to build from their own uh, understanding of the world. So that is what I can say uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, David, building on exactly that direction, um, in, in addition to what Thoma was saying that when we build for community, we need to kind of abandon our personal worldview. Uh, there's a question which is quite in this direction that specifically in the farmer context that farmers have intimate and profound knowledge of their cro crops and environment, which is far more advanced than academic research alone. How can we as researchers showcase this to researchers and the general public? Thanks. That, that's a great question. And Tom, I also thank you for your comments in line with this. So I think one of the disservices we have done to ourselves and also to farmers is to kind of put them up as uneducated individuals who need somebody to come and teach them how to do what they do. And I have been, I knew this, but I have been extra humbled when I joined my father, who's been a farmer for over 40 years. The level of not just arts, science that is required to be able to produce a crop is something that cannot be underestimated. The, the local awareness, the ability to figure out that I should plan for something to be able to read the weather. It's both a combination of art and science that research alone will not be able to do. So I think for us as researchers, one of the first things, and I think in line with what Tom is saying, being able to embed ourselves in the community or with the people who are creating these solutions in this context, farmers, understand why they do the things they do, why they do them the way they do them, right? And then think of research, data, technology, not as something that is going to disrupt, because we tend to hear that term, technology as a disruptor, as if whatever is existing is not already achieving good things, but more of technology and research as a way to elevate or to enhance what you're doing. And I think once we take that approach or we have that positioning, it is much easier for us to understand what kind of um, innovations farmers already have and how can the research we bring in allow that to become more enhanced. So give you an example, um, my dad and I over the past one and a half years that I've been working much closely with him, we've been realizing that at least in Ghana, um, a lot of the seeds that we have are hybrid seeds being imported from different parts of world, the world. The outcome of that is that a lot of the seeds do not necessarily germinate to the optimum level that he used to see. So now we want to go back and figure out why is this happening. So now I go back and I look online and I see a paper from Nature that is talking maybe about the yam seedling. And now we are looking at the history of how the yam seedling came about and what are the pros of the cons. And I'm starting to explain to him why a seed that in the past when it was heirloom was doing well, but now it is hybrid and what are some of the deficiencies? And he's starting to appreciate it to the point that he's even reading things on his own. Um, so I am not disrupting the way he goes about farming. I am enhancing the way he thinks about farming so that he can do what he does much better because what my dad knows from the 40 years of experience, I am not even close to it. So I think it's that level of humility, that level of positioning where it's more research as an enhancer as an elevator of what is already being done by people like farmers. Yeah, very well said in terms of um, humility, in terms of what we bring and what, what farmers are bringing, but just not farmers, whoever is in the local communities in different contexts. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Zulidan, I think this is very like related to also local concern. Something that you said that historically speaking, people are, more of a narrator than writer that causes uh, documentation, uh, like people aren't so aware of how to document. So the question is more about, is this right for us to stick with the traditional way of documenting thing, which is in terms of just journal? Or do you think that we can come up with a more creative way to allow 
people to document their experience and their knowledge, which is adding to the journal, but journal isn't a barrier for them. Okay. Uh, this has also become our discussion uh, nowadays that a journal is not the only ways that we can document, uh, we can keep in our uh, knowledge here. Uh, especially like uh, David says about local awareness, they have uh, local wisdoms. So we also build a repository, so which is we don't need any uh, reviewer to review, but that's uh, one of many ways that we create. We, we know uh, at least in my organization because we concern only about journals we doing our part in this journal publication but when we are going to the corner of uh let's say in a rural areas like uh, they don't really care about academic publishing but they care about science so we can combine this kind of community with the, the associations that also has, say, concern, the same concern, for example, like uh, people in urban, urban areas, uh, they don't really care about uh, academic publishing, but they really care about how to make their areas more beneficial for them. So because we have people also in associations of urban planning, for example, we connect them uh, and they can, let's say they uh, can have like a social, uh, you know, it's what we call it, uh, social services for the associations. And because uh, in Indonesia, uh, teachers like me, uh, teachers in university, we have three main, uh, uh, three mains of uh, three main jobs: teaching, researching, and also social services. So with these three jobs that we have to do all together, we need to always collaborating with many kind of organization and association. That's why in my country, association, it's a very huge numbers. We have many kinds of difference, but uh, if we ask, if the question is about documenting, we have several ways, but in my case, in my organization, we only focus on this uh, journal publications. I also uh, see in chat box also a question about APC, if I'm not mistaken, Malfika. Is it uh, the question for? Yeah, that's a question uh, for you as well. If you want to address that, what is the relation of uh, a relationship with DOHA and uh, mm -hmm. adv advising promoters oh. of journals about APC? So, uh, as volunteers, uh, we also have associate editors and editors in uh, my organization in RGE. We have editors and associate editors. Uh, these people uh, helping the OIG voluntarily and they also help uh, journal managers to, let's say, having the quality, enhance their quality of publication as what the OIG wants. So uh, we, we know that the OIG have uh, several uh, requirements. So uh, those people, uh, the connection is, uh, they also volunteer in the OIG and they also volunteer in RGE. So it's, it, it's a connection that make us to share what we get from the OIG and then sharing to share to uh, journal managers in uh, Indonesia. But, uh, like I said before, started from 2020, we decide to sponsor, uh, become bronze sponsor to the OIG to, uh, to build a, a milestone that we support the open science. So 
I cannot briefly <laughs> explain what kind of what kind of uh, relationship it's because we all volunteers there and we here. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. Feel free to add any links that you think people should know. But I really want to bring back what you said that um, combining people with different skills and different interests. Mm -hmm. So we just are not writing journals, but uh, mm -hmm. combining social concern with scientists. So people who are interested in writing can write, but scientists can do their science and do what they're better at. Yeah, I really love that. So. I want to ask one question and then I am also open for the speakers to ask each other question if they are willing to. But my question is in, in general, if you have uh, also spoken to a lot of people and uh, I'm imagining the people have asked you, so what can I do to, to you know become part of the narrative that you are part of? So I would just go through again, all speakers to, share one sentence of what would be your answer of what can I do? Uh, Natalie, can I start with you? Thanks, what a great question. Um, I would say in, in relation to opening up uh, conversations about how data and in my field in health, um, but you know, I think this kind of applies across a range of fields as well, um, how that data is used to kind of drive science and scientific insights. I would say the one thing you can do is think about the accessibility of the language that you might use to describe your research. So quite often you have to do things like lay summaries, but I take it beyond that and say, you know, think about the grandma test. How do you describe what you do and how you uh, how you want to take your research to your grandmother? And um, I would say focus on that kind of accessibility and understandability for those who might not be technically minded who might not have the kind of the training that you do when it comes to explaining and talking about and celebrating um, the research that you do so the grandma test is probably my key bit of advice thank you so much uh, i do like the non-technical aspect of uh, communication um, christine we'll come back to your question uh, after I finish this with uh, Toma next. Okay, thank you. So the okay. advice I can give to people who want to join or to build uh, open lab or maker spaces, mostly don't put equipment before because the, the first thing to have is just the space and the community. And then you can design uh, your space from the needs of uh, your community because your maker space should or your open lab should reflect uh, the needs of the community. So the first thing to do is just to have a space, an open space for discussion with uh, the community. So you can decide what you want to do from there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thoma. David. I like this, a similar thread going on here. Um, so I think for me, there's a, there's an entire gap in where people from what I define as resource constraints environments, which is as we're talking about, people who don't have access to high technical infrastructure that is very stable internet, a very advanced computing, or access to high technical skills. So that is if either not being formally educated or don't can't use programming languages. So there's a space to actually be there and help them bridge that gap, either for us to take whatever we are building to them so that it exists in their context or bring them towards where these tools are or actually go both ways. So that is one place that I discovered an area to focus my work. I started out as a bioinformatician and I was excited about that, but I quickly realized that data literacy is even the first foundation before we start doing all the advanced things. So that's what I've been working. So I think just pay attention to what exists in the world and who is not as Natalie and I think Tom is saying that who is not able to access those things. Um, these people are solving amazing problems in their context. If they are able to remove barriers that prevent them from solving that, then the world would be an amazing place and you can build a career out of that. That's wonderful, uh, make world a better place and make it your career. Uh, finally, Zilithiana. 
Oh, the amazing answer is already <laughs> told, but everyone's before me. So yeah, well, frankly speaking, uh, for me myself, uh, I always, I always told everybody that's uh, celebrating the learning from everywhere. So this is a very, very you know, uh, in my I often meet people that they have those barriers like uh, David said, they have also sometimes uh, the old standards, they have uh, the old uh, point of view, uh, they are not really pay attention that the world is changing. So uh, sometimes it's, uh, I have to be very humble to ask them to let's learn together, open uh, uh, open your mind, open your eyes, and we solve the problem from any part that you can solve. Uh, in that kind of part, while we are solving the problems, we will find what the great for our career, actually. So before it becomes public relation, I really kind of uh, really passionate researchers, but uh, I found out that being a researcher is, has to be not only research, but I have to tell to the world what kind of research that, that I'm doing. So I need uh, somebody else, or I need tools to tell to the world the research is about something that probably, uh, you know, uh, somebody else can duplicate or replicate my research or use it for the policymakers and so on. That's why uh, learning is always my best lines before decided. Because when we are solving the problem and we are learning, uh, sometimes we find the career appears just, just like, just like that. <laughs> That's all for me, Masika. No, wonderful. I think this really complements uh, all the speakers where. We want to work in solidarity rather than subordination, mm -hmm. uh, bring people to the same level of equity in terms of knowledge and also maintaining the humility. Christine, would you like to ask question or should I go ahead as you're in the train? I love the view, by the way. Yeah, I, I will ask the question. So Christine has uh, asked one question for Natalie. Sometimes science has to inform politicians in situations where we are still lacking knowledge for definition, de for definite recommendations. Some scientists then adopt a position that is not necessarily fully supported by science and possibly rather is a personal opinion. How do you think we can bridge that gap between what science can offer and what politicians would like to get? Wow, what, what a pertinent question, particularly given our current, uh, current environment. And um, really challenging one. I think what I'd say is, I mean, science is inherently uncertain. It, you know, the whole thing is based on a method of doubt. Right. So actually, from all of my work, talking to members of the public to, to non scientists people accept that they accept that there is risk, that there is uncertainty, that you can, you know, you can have good evidence for something, but you're not necessarily saying it's the, it's the, it's the gospel truth. Um, and actually, they're very, very good at detecting when you're kind of being disingenuous or when you're lying or when you're kind of over promising or over hyping um, certain claims. Um, and, and that in and of itself do doesn't help build trust. If, if it appears that you're sort of making claims that are based on certainty when they're really not. Um, so the fact is that actually for, for some scientists, there is a very legitimate ground to having a public debate. You say that some evidence suggests this, some evidence suggests that. Um, we don't quite know how to reconcile these things, but it is the nature of science that we will continue to challenge and question. And, you know, hopefully, ideally, you sort of incrementally improve the knowledge base. Right? Playing all that out in a public sphere is really difficult, though, because as, as, as Christine rightly points out, politicians want certainty, they want answers, they want fixes. Um, but I would say in terms of what's, what science and scientists can offer, it's that acknowledgement of a degree of uncertainty around findings, around results, and being, and being straight with people, because people will appreciate that. If you say something is 100% risk-free um, and you know, it, it's guaranteed, no one will believe you. <laughs> Um, but if you say, look, here is what we think, uh, and it's based on you know, th this evidence, and we can explain that, but we also acknowledge that there are some limitations to that, and subsequent research you know, might, might change how we think about this, 
that acknowledgement is generally seen as much more trustworthy by members of the public than a politician who overclaims things. And nobody trusts politicians. So I would say don't try and emulate their level of certainty um, because they're not trusted by anyone, frankly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we are at the, at the end of our cohort call and we really were ambitious where we thought we can have reflection on the call. But I'm pushing that to our assignment. And the assignment is based on all these conversations that we are having in the last 12 weeks, and especially today in, in terms of where we want people to think about their own project. We would like you to take some time to think about what brought you to your work, to open leadership, what makes you feel motivated? Uh, what will you need to feel motivated for another five years? And what will you need to stay motivated for the rest of your career? Um, and with that, I'd like to thank our speakers for fueling us with a lot of new ideas and, and helping us focus on what is important in the current world. Um, thank you all. Anything else, uh, we would stay in the call for five minutes, but we will stop recording. Thank you so much once again, everybody, and especially the speakers. Feel free to unmute yourself and clap, uh, which is not a general <laughs> thing that we do these days. But yeah, take take the chance and give a round of applause to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Masika. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah. I'm sorry again for 